Um, I'm Andy Oates, um, and I'm going to talk to you today about the segmentation clock. And that's a topic that my lab's been working on now for about um, 15 years, I think. And I had an interest in this topic when I was a postdoc, too. So maybe I've been suffering from segmentation compulsive disorder for about 20 years now which is not to say that I understand everything about it uh, by any means. What I wanted to do for the next three lectures is to give you, to try and break the subject into three parts, characterize kind of by spatial scales, and talk about those three parts um, in order. Of course, these parts relate to each other, uh, and I hope that I'll tease that out as I go along. So I'm, I'm currently swapping backwards and forwards between London and Lausanne at the moment. Um, and uh, so these are, I should acknowledge the people who have helped me uh, work in the last little while. It's the Francis Crick Institute and uh, University College London, uh, supported by the Wellcome Trust, uh, both in London and uh, more recently now the uh, EPFL in Lausanne. So, uh, right, so let's get started. The segmentation clock. Um, the basic problem is kind of in one of embryology, and it's how vertebrates form their body structure. And so you can see I've got a collection of vertebrates here on the, on the slide, and they've all got a, uh, a segmentation. Uh, their, their body axis is segmented from the head-to-tail axis. And when you see a pattern like this, and you're in, in you, uh, sorry, let me just, so that's what we're going to talk about, how that pattern arises. So here's the, here's the overview of the talk. First, going to in introduce segmentation. Then I'm going to talk about noisy uh, autonomous oscillators. I'm going to talk about negative feedback. Uh, I'm going to talk about period mutants, which are mutants where the period of the process uh, changes and what that's taught us. And then I'm going to uh, try and discuss some open questions, which I um, think are relevant. So, all right, so you, as a developmental biologist, you typically are interested in things like the, uh, the shape and size and number of body parts or structures. And what characterizes, I think, the questions that I'm interested in are um, the role of timing in, in, in creating the, the structures of the, of the embryo. So we are interested then in, um, that was a human, um, and it was a, oh, it's going to go back. That was a human skeleton, and you can see the segmented backbone of a human here, all the way down its backbone itself, but also the, the ribs are segmented, and in fact, though you can't see it in this image, the, the muscle and skin is, is segmented as well. We use our segmented muscles between our ribs for breathing, called intercostal muscles, uh, but other animals uh, use them to move, and one good example is a fish. So fish uses the muscles that it has between its body segments to, to swim, and so they're of, of enormous significance for a fish uh, when it moves. So this is a zebrafish, which is the animal that that uh, we've studied, and mostly um, a lot of what I'll talk about today and over the next couple of days is from zebrafish, partly because it's what I understand the best, but also because I think there's some aspects of that model organism that have led us to be able to see things that perhaps other have not have been more difficult or challenging in other organisms. And it could also be that the zebrafish is a bit simpler in how it works, uh, and that's also given us some insights. Okay, now here's a zebrafish skeleton. Um, uh, prepared so you don't see the muscles, you can see the, the repeated structures of the centra and of the ribs, of the neural arches, which guard the spinal column, uh, the spinal cord, the, the neurons along the back, and the hemal arches, which guard the major blood vessels that uh, bring blood to the tail. And that's, that's the structures I'm going to be talking about. And if you want to understand how they come about, oops, you have to go and look back in the embryo. And this is a time-lapse movie of a zebrafish embryo. It started when it's covering the yolk. You can see its head forming here. Here's an eye, the ears forming back here. And you can, I hope you can see these uh, blocks of cells forming. They're budding off from a tissue in the posterior one by one. So you can, I hope you can see the, the boundaries forming. These form rhythmically and sequentially. That's the key concept here. The body segments forming rhythmically and sequentially. That should loop. Nope. OK. Okay, so, ah, right, so it's sort of, yeah, it's one of the mysteries of 
presentations. Okay, so now let's let's look at these things again. They're, they're balls of, of several hundred cells that uh, that sort of that roll up, and each of these forming boundaries is caused because the cells on the outside of the ball epithelialize. Their basal surface is the outside, so it's like a cyst, and the uh, apical surfaces point into the middle of the middle of the segment. So we're interested then in these are called somites. We're interested in what's going on in that posterior tissue then that's producing the rhythmic morphogenesis of the segments. Now, each, each of these segments will then go and give rise to the bone and the muscle and the, and the skin that we just described. Okay, so what you would have noticed from that movie, and it's been noticed for a long time, is that the, that the addition of the segments is, is rhythmic. And you can get an idea for that by time-lapsing. And here's the sort of rig that we use. We make a... Um, uh, we make a small depression in an agarose, in agarose, in a microscope dish. We make a little cone, and that allows us to slot the, the, the yolk of the fish in so that the fish isn't pinned. It's not held firmly. It's just resting on top of the agarose. And then we can film an array of these embryos growing at the same time. And then from the movies, we count the time point when each successive boundary is formed. We can record that then. And for an individual embryo, what you can see, and now looking at the, the somites along the trunk, forming with elapsed time. And for one embryo, you can see the um, very regular formation of, this, of, these, of these boundaries. Uh, and we'll for a, put a slope through that will give you the period with which the segment boundaries are forming. And that seems to be constant in the trunk. What's really remarkable, I think, is when you look at a population of embryos, these are 15 brothers and sisters sitting on the same stage. This is the mean and the standard deviation of segment formation times in, in those in those animals. So this is an incredibly precise rhythmic process that's going on. Okay, and this, this precision, I mean, this, it wasn't, I think, until, um, until around this time that, that we got a measure of the precision for the first time, but the idea of the rhythmicity uh, has led people to speculate for some time that there might be some sort of clock or oscillator that's behind, behind this process. And that idea goes back to the 1970s. And it's an idea from uh, Jonathan Cook and Chris Seaman, and it's called the clock and wavefront mechanism. So I want to tell you about that now. It's a very generic proposal. doesn't depend on the microscopic details. Um, it has two elements, a clock and a wavefront, so it's well named. Um, and I'm going to illustrate them to you now. So previously, what I showed you was fish uh, growing from a lateral side, so they were sort of extending out this way. Uh, now we're flipping the animal over so you can see that when, when vertebrates form their, their, their uh, body structures, they're actually bilaterally symmetrical. So the head would be out here. This is the tail bud. Here are the two arms of the pre-Semitic mesoderm. And here are already formed segments. Now, the clock is this population of cells in the posterior. And in this simulation, they're going to oscillate. We'll keep track of the phase, which is think about of a clock. And you can think of a, uh, the hand of a clock moving around the clock face. So all we're interested in is in the angle. Don't care about the length of the the length of the, of the hand. And it can be, you can imagine that at 12, it's dark blue. Then it gets lighter and lighter to white at 6, and then comes back and gets darker and darker. So that's how we could illustrate phase. And that's what I'll, I'll illustrate phase today. The granularity here, that's, that's a cell. It's one of the oscillating units, this little yellow unit. And um, the, these, will these will all oscillate together. OK, that's the clock. Um, uh, the other element is a wavefront. It's this black line. And the wavefront is a rule that says uh, when an oscillator hits the wavefront, its, its phase angle is recorded. Now, uh, in this case, it's going to be arrested. It's going to be stopped. And then whatever phase it was when the wavefront hit it will be color-coded. It will go from being blue to red. But that's, that's it being recorded. And then it's stopped. It's left behind. And so when we see these two, when the interaction of these two things will... Be a, is a way of recording permanently the temporal activity in the clock. That's what the wavefront does. OK, and to get an animal to extend, we're just going to add oscillators on this end um, uh, at a certain rate. And that rate at which the tissue then extends is exactly the same rate at which the, the wavefront will move across the oscillators. So in that sense, the tissue itself won't change its length at all. We call this the infinite snake. We we'll just keep keep growing out. Oscillators will be added at one end, and they'll be they'll hit the wavefront at the other end. So this is what happens: the clock oscillates. It now elongates. You can see that w what's left behind then is uh, a, a permanent periodic record 
of the temporal activity that was going on in here. And you could also see, I hope, that, um, that cell um, drifting in the, um, it's at rest in the lab reference frame, but it's drifting in the reference frame of the tissue. So just do that one more time. There you go. So the wave front's moving, and each of the oscillators that it hits goes from red, goes from, is stopped, and goes from blue to red. And so the pattern that's left behind then, um, uh, which we'll call the segment length, so from two peak, one peak to the next or from one trough to the next, anywhere along that, along that periodic pattern, that's given by the velocity of the wave front multiplied by the period of this uh, clock in the posterior. So that's it, really. That's, that's the rule. Um, of course, you can... You can um, uh, this is, this is, uh, there's two things to say about this kind of mechanism. Uh, one is that the, I just said the segment length is the velocity times by the period. The other is that the total number of segments that an animal would make under this kind of rule um, is given by the duration, so just how long it keeps this mechanism up, uh, divided by the period. So very simple. But the reason why I'm hammering on about this is because the, um, the period here appears um, as uh, causative for the eventual anatomy, the eventual anatomical structures that, that appear in the, in the adult. And so when this idea came up, I think, as far as I understand, it was the first time that the, the idea of using, a, using timing to cause structure in the embryo had become explicit. And I think that idea was then used in a number of other circumstances in embryology. So I think it's a very, it's a very powerful idea. It's, it's a very um, influential idea. OK, so for example, um, in, uh, in, in limb bud growth, people have talked about having some sort of clock or timer in the outgrowing, uh, in outgrowing limb bud. All right, so let's see, where are we? So clock on my front. Um, and so that idea languished uh, for a while. People discussed it. But it wasn't until 1997 that some evidence from an embryo was found about the molecular nature of a set of oscillators in the posterior tissue of vertebrate. It was found in a chick embryo, sorry, um, and uh, by Olivier Porquier's lab. And I'm just going to come to the dynamics of that. But I, what I realize I forgot to say is um, I wanted to show you, because in these, in these images, you can't see the cells. In here, they're made up cells. So I want you to see what real cells look like in that tissue as it's forming segments. Okay, so this is now a confocal, uh, is a, 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 an optical slice with a con confocal microscope. Where we're using a transgenic line that marks the histones, and you can see individual nuclei of cells sitting in the tissue. So here's the uh, developing central nervous system. There's a layer of skin right around the outside, and this tissue now down here is the mesoderm, the tail bud here, the pre-Semitic mesoderm here, and here I hope you can see the shapes of newly formed somites. So let me. Let me loop this movie a couple of times. Two things to notice off this movie is that when a somite forms, it does so actually by rather subtle rearrangements in the cells um, at the anterior of the tissue. So if you look here, that looked uniform, but, but now the cells are reorganizing themselves. And so cell, cellular material is some, in some sense being ejected or segregated out of the, the main body of the tissue. OK, at the same time, material is being added at the other end. So that comes into the tissue by a number of different means. Um, but the point being that, the, that there's a, a rate at which cells are removed from one end of the tissue, and there's, an, and there's a, another rate, could be the same, could be different, of cells that are added to that end. So in that sense, the pre-Semitic mesoderm isn't a fixed. When, when I talk about the pre-Semitic mesoderm, when we talk about it, it's not a fixed set of cells. It's actually a, a reference frame in which there's a continuous movement of cells. Uh, they're continuously being added at this end, and they're continuously being ejected at that end. So, uh, so that means that we can also talk about a flow, a slow flow of cells in the reference frame of that tissue. To give you some idea and analogy, then, if you about how these cells are moving around, can you see this tissue boundary? Look at the cells on the dorsal edge of the paraxial mesoderm, on the, the tissue we're interested in, and the cells there. Can you see that there's a there's a shear between those two? That gives you some idea of the movement of, of the cells in the tissue, um, in this case, relative to the neighboring tissue. OK, so that, I hope that gives you an idea of the sort of granularity of the events in a zebrafish and also of the sort of displacement of cells in the system as it goes. This is a slow displacement. All right. Um, now, um, now, 
what's going on in those cells, and this is, brings us to the segmentation clock. So the first molecular evidence for this came, as I was saying, uh, in the chick from Olivier Porquier's lab, and that reference is down here. So I've, I've tried to put references through the talk, and you can have the PDFs afterwards, so um, hopefully you can chase up any of these things that you find interesting. This is a zebrafish, obviously, and this is a transgenic animal that was made in, in my lab, uh, which has two transgenes. One is a gene called HER1. It's been fused to YFP so that the fusion protein becomes fluorescent. It has a short half-life. It's about 12 or 13 minutes. And so um, you can see, uh, what I hope you can see is that there are waves of green signal that are sweeping along this tissue. So there's an elevated signal posterior, and then the wave travels anteriorly through the tissue. The wave shortens its distance as it moves anteriorly, and then it arrests, both the wave arrests and these, the signal switches off right at the anterior end of the tissue, and just where it finishes predicts the position of each newly forming segment. There's a very strong coincidence, temporal coincidence, between the arrival of one of these waves and the formation of a new segment. And the other transgene in this animal um, called MESP, uh, which uh, won't play a role again today, I don't think, um, marks quite a small cluster of cells on the anterior si side of each of those forming segments. And there's a, there's a moment in the development of each segment where the incoming wave is, uh, is sitting in those cells, and just before it dies out, it co-expresses with this, with this red gene. So this might be some sort of um, illustration of a, a temporal uh, pattern and then a permanent periodic pattern that's left behind. Right, segmentation clock. You, again, you can't really see the uh, cells uh, back here, so let's zoom in again using, again, a confocal. And this is now the same transgene, the, the HER1 YFP. I'm going to come back to HER1 in much more detail, but for now I just want you to think of it as a marker of, these, of, the, sort of, of the dynamic expression that's going on in that tissue. So here again, the tail bud, pre-Semitic mesoderm, the central nervous system sitting over here, the yolk and the head would be down here. And what, I, what you can see now are individual nuclei. These aren't lit up by histone anymore. They, the signal you're seeing is the, uh, the transcription factor entering the nucleus and then becoming fluorescent. It's actually degraded in the nucleus, so it, it never leaves again. So you see each of the nuclei becoming bright and dark and bright and dark. So this is, this is what those waves were. If you look at an individual cell, it's clear that the cell isn't moving with the velocity, phase velocity of the wave through the tissue. It's switching on and off, and it's the the coordination of the neighboring oscillations that gives rise to this wave that moves through the tissue. <clears throat> okay, so we have a population of genetic oscillators. Um, and so from what I've showed you, yeah. They are dividing. Not, not, uh, so they're dividing about, I guess it's about 10 times slower than the cycle that you're watching here. But there are cell divisions that go on throughout that tissue, yeah. Yes, we can completely block cell division, genetically or with drugs, and the whole phenomenon occurs. I'm not saying it's exactly the same, but uh, yeah, it's not required at all to get this to happen. In, in, in vertebrates, there's some interesting cases in uh, annelids where there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between cell division and segmentation. But that's not true. It's not true in vertebrates. Yep. The, the half-life of the transgene is on the order of 12 to 13 minutes. And the, the, period, the period of these oscillations we're talking about being in the tens of minutes. And so for the temperature here, and, and for a 12-minute half-life, uh, 28.5 degrees Celsius, plus or minus, plus or minus 0.1 degree. Um, and so this is quite a, this is an interesting period for an oscillator. It's not long like a circadian clock, which one might typically associate with genetic oscillators. And it's not short like a calcium oscillation or a neural oscillation, which typically depend on ionic currents. So it's somehow in the middle. And it actually took us uh, five or six years to finally be able to see this by balancing the microscopy and the, and the me and sort of, I won't bore you with the details, but I'm happy to share them with you, um, of how to get the time scales right so we could, could see this. We're still learning, actually, uh, obviously. So, OK, um, there's, a, there's an interesting model for this, uh, which was actually the reason why I moved to London in the first place, uh, because 
They've installed segmentation clock models in all of the tubes in London. And uh, it's, it's sort of a joke, but it actually illustrates a bunch of the questions about the segmentation clock quite nicely. So when you look at this, you see three kinds of patterns, or three kinds of elements. You can see that an individual pixel or, la or lamp or unit in the tissue is switching on and off. And if you just watch that, you'll see that it switches on and off with a rhythmic pattern. It'll, it'll, it'll repeat over and over again. So you can ask all sorts of questions about, OK, why is that switching on and off? Why does it have the period that it does, et cetera? Um, you can ask, now you notice that if you pick your favorite pixel and you look at the neighboring pixels, it's strongly correlated. So if, one, if your pixel's on, there's a high chance that some or all of the neighboring pixels are on and conversely off. Uh, when they're off. And so you can ask questions about that. You know, does one pixel induce its neighbor to be on, or is something else outside telling them all on to be at the same time? Or, um, and finally, the thing that's most obvious, of course, to us is the global organization of this oscillating pattern, which is words telling you to get off at Moorgate at the next stop, if that's what you want to do. So now, uh, one imp so th this is really actually quite similar to the segmentation clock. There's one key difference in the phenomenology, which is that there are no new lamps being added at this end, and there are no lamps being ejected at that end. So this is kind of a steady state segmentation clock. There's, no, there's nothing moving, no, 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 uh, no um, matter being added or removed from the, from the, from the tissue. Um, OK, so, and then maybe just to finish this analogy off, you could imagine using this system to do something periodically, even though that pattern is complicated, Every time the M in Morgate arrives at one end, you could use that to trigger a particular event. You could say everything that's M leaves the tissue. And the next time Morgate comes up, everything that's M leaves the tissue. So okay, that's I think gives you some sort of idea. Okay, and actually these these units, and I'm about to run out of batteries, um, are the topics of the three lectures. Uh, broken down into biological units, which I'm gonna list here. So we can think of trying to understand What's the nature of the cellular oscillations? We can think to ask, what's the nature of this local correlation, a synchronization between, between the, um, the oscillators? And then we can think about trying to understand these tissue level wave patterns, how, how they arise, what they're good for, if they're good for anything. And although it's still not entirely clear, um, the connections between the different levels uh, will be important. If you're an engineer, you can imagine lots of different ways you could design that, that notice in the train. Um, and many would work, right? There's potentially as many different ways to get it to work as there are people sitting in this room. Um, so we can't just look at the pattern and understand how it works. We have to break it. Uh, we have to try and build it. And we have to make models of it to see whether our ideas are going in the right direction or not. Um, I, you know, it's kind of an unusual question at this stage, but does anyone have any AAA batteries? <laughs> or a long stick? Uh, or a laser pointer? Okay. It's still changing, but the, I guess the, for a laser of this intensity, we need a bit more sort of big cable or something. Yeah. All right. So um, cellular oscill oscillators, that's, the, uh, that's the, the subject now. Okay, so... The, the first question I wanted, the first issue I wanted to uh, discuss is whether or not these cells are, well, you know, gosh, I need glasses. Uh, triple. Triple A. Yeah. Three A's. Um, was to ask the question, so I, I deliberately didn't say, when I said cellular oscillators, I deliberately didn't say anything about whether they could tick by themselves. There are cells oscillating, but we need to, if we want to, to. Hey, thank you. Sure. Um, uh, I think uh, a fundamental question to get started with is to understand whether these oscillators need to talk to each other to oscillate, or whether they can do it by themselves. And it will influence the way you try and write down um, models for the, for the thing. OK, so this has been a, a topic of debate and interest for a while. And um, what's been clear for quite a long time is that if you cut out this tissue, the pre-Semitic mesoderm, this has been done in both chicken and mouse, and you 
separate it away from the central nervous system and the skin and the other neighboring tissues, you put it in a dish, it will continue to segment by itself. So it will actually bud at one end. It's not clear whether the, the size and the shape and the timing is correct, but still, qualitatively, that tissue will, will segment itself. So it's been clear for some time that the tissue is autonomous. So now we need to break the tissue open somehow, and studies doing that from, from this is one from Chick, looking at um, cells which change their, this was done by growing cells, uh, and then fixing them and asking whether their patterns look different. But of course, there's lots of, there's another interpretation to seeing a sort of salt and pepper pattern here. That, that cell could be on because it's in the up phase, uh, and that cell there could be off because it's in the down phase, or this cell could be stuck on, and that cell could be stuck off. So it, it doesn't solve the problem. What one needs is a, a, a live reporter, which I showed you. Uh, and that the first group to introduce a live reporter in the segmentation clock was, the, was Ryo Kagiyama's group from the Institute of Virus Research um, in Kyoto. And so this is, the, uh, this is the entire data set from mouse. Um, yeah, you just saw it. And um, it consists of three cells which fluctuate in time. I'll play them again. Um, and so this, it, according to uh, Rio, it was difficult to find cells that would show any uh, behavior like this. Um, and here's, here's the trace of one of them. And so the conclusion of the paper was that uh, signals from other cells are likely to be essential for ongoing oscillations. That was the, that was the conclusion of that paper. Um, so we repeated those experiments uh, quite a lot later uh, using the new transgene that, transgenes that we built in the zebrafish. And we did the following experiment. We, we noticed that the tail bud, um, this, is, this black line is the trace of intensity measured from the, from the tail bud in, in, in the movies. You notice that it had a quite precise rhythm, um, which you can get from uh, the autocorrelation uh, function of the of the of the phase, and then you can you can you can uh, by the envelope of that you can see you can calculate a, a persistence time, so it's it's quite it's quite precise, and so what we did was we thought well maybe there are some clock like cells back there, um, we chopped off the tip of the tail bud, and incubated it in a in a medium that contained uh, elevated levels of FGF, which is a, a signaling protein and also serum, so which contains almost every known signaling protein. So this is a bit of a cocktail that's strongly stimulating, and our idea was let's, let's make the environment of a, of a, of a tail bud. Let's see if we can get, keep these cells to oscillate. Um, I mean, the mouse cells were also incubated with FGF and serum, but okay, we're going to try the zebrafish. Um, and this is what we saw. The cells appeared to be quite happy to oscillate in vitro. And if you look at that cell, for example, is not touching any other cell in this movie, um, and it oscillates several times. Whoops, let me just show you that again. You look at that one, switching on and then off, uh, and then on again. And in fact, uh, doing these movies over a sort of standard interval of, of 10 hours, we saw many cells that would persistently oscillate through the time. And what we also noticed was that if you take a whole bunch of these cells now separated from each other and record them, they continue to oscillate, but they're not organized anymore into local, locally coordinated waves. So the, and so it looks as if the cells are quite noisy. They'll keep oscillating, but they're no longer either coordinated with each other, and actually nor do they keep a, a, a consistent uh, period, an internal period. Uh, they're not, um, you wouldn't want to use them as a clock, actually. Uh, they wouldn't be very useful. So. Than, than in the animal? Yeah. yeah. Um, if, if we take the most precise of the, of, the, um, of the individual cells and compare that to the precision of the tissue, then the tissue is at, is at least five times more precise. That's the most precise of those cells. Even the best, one, Even the best ones are five times worse than the tissue. And some of those cells are so bad uh, that the way we were measuring the, the quality factor, the, it didn't work. 
So, so there's a, and I'll, I'll come back to why the precision goes up when they're in the tissue uh, tomorrow. Um, in fact, so, so in fact, individual cells sitting all by themselves on the bottom of a dish, they'll continue to oscillate. And that, that was a, a movie. Um, this cell is, if you follow that, that's the only cell in that well. These experiments were done by serial dilution. And this cell continues to oscillate. So you can see it's, it's, uh, it's trace over here. So we, we think that in the zebrafish, segmentation clock cells are autonomous oscillators. Yeah, yeah, they can. I'm not going to talk about that today, um, but they can talk to each other. Yeah, that's right. So today, what I wanted to do is to f keep focusing on the individual cell as a unit and what, what we can try and understand about that. So, looking at all, so looking at these things, the thing we noticed was how heterogeneous these rhythms were, and we saw cells that sort of build their amplitude. We saw cells that appear to stop. Some cells are not oscillating, then they do two pulses, and then they stop again. Here's a little interval where the cell stopped oscillating. So um, we wanted to try and understand the kind of noise that's here. And a couple of things you can ask is whether the amplitude is correlated. And the amplitude is quite well correlated. So that means when a cell starts going up, it keeps going up for a while. And when it starts going down, it keeps going down for a while. But the period is, is not correlated. That means that if you know one interpeak interval, it gives you very, very little information about the next interpeak interval. So this is a kind of unusual situation. Um, and the time scale of the correlations in the amplitude is, is longer than the period, much longer than the period. We're not, not quite sure exactly how much longer, but it's. And so without any internal knowledge of the oscillator, we wanted to get a measure for these types of noise. And we used a very generic model of an oscillator. I'm just going to sketch it for you now. Um, we keep track of the phase of the oscillator, which is the angle of the hand that I was talking about before. And that's um, given by the frequency of the oscillator. So here we're assuming there's an oscillator. Right? We've, we're assuming there's an oscillator because we've given it a, a frequency. And this can, this can be influenced by the amplitude. The amplitude is r. And that the time evolution of, of, the, um, of the amplitude is given by um, by this parameter mu, which you can see here, which is some sort of distance that the system has to a bifurcation point. So you can think of that as being equivalent to some sort of driving force that makes the amplitudes grow or shrink to nothing and die away. And so you could, this model really talks about the transition between a limit cycle and a fixed point. Yeah, this, should, should the amplitude have? It means that bigger, if the R is big, then it will keep only by going down. Yes. Um, it mean, uh, the effective omega goes down. I think because the, as your, as your uh, R goes up, um, you take longer to get through your cycle. So your, your frequency goes down. Does that make sense? Yep. That's, that's the simple, that's, you know, you, you're producing something, you, take a, you, take, you, you produce a lot of it, and now it takes a long time to get rid of it. Right. So now, but, but it's not clear that the two are coupled. Okay, this is the generic form where you allow coupling between the frequency and the, and the, um, and the, uh, um, and the, um, and the amplitude, thank you. But actually, when you plot frequency versus amplitude, it's very poorly, it's actually very poorly correlated. So we're going to simplify things by leaving that coupling out for first approximation. Okay. So now, here's the, here's the data from the, uh, from, the, um, from the cells. And then we can use this model to, um, so it's, just be very clear, this model is being used to try and understand the magnitude and the time scales of the noise. What kind of noise? It's, not, it's, it's no surprise that this thing is stopping oscillating and then starting oscillating again, because that's the behavior of the model. And if we allow that the, the parameter omega to, um, sorry, mu to, to vary, 
then of course we're going to um, stop oscillating and start oscillating. The question is, um, what values of the noise for the period and the noise for the uh, for the amplitude match the match the data? So that was the question. And so I'm just going to say that um, there is a, a long time scale noise in the amplitude, and that's actually very well fit by some sort of coloured noise, so an ornstein ullenbeck process. Uh, whereas the the noise in the um, in the period, I mentioned that was uncorrelated, that's very well modeled by white noise. So that's, that's actually the conclusions at this point, is that when we take these cells out of the embryo, they look like they're really close to the edge of oscillating. They'll oscillate, and then they'll stop oscillating again, and they'll oscillate, and they'll stop oscillating again. And so we think about this a long time scale in the, in, of, of them oscillating, and then stopping again, and then we think about a short time scale noise in exactly what the frequency, the period will be if they are in the oscillatory phase. Uh, the, the yeah, we're we're missing these these high these high events. Yep, and that is uh, that is definitely a shortcoming in the model. Yeah, I, I don't understand uh, where they are. Oh. Uh, they're, no, they're, um, they are correlated with some multiple of the period. So, so two, three, maybe more. Yeah, that's right. So maybe if I put that in, in molecular terms, I might say, you know, maybe what's causing the drift between the oscillatory and the non-oscillatory state is something like ribosome queuing. Or or blocking or or competing for entry into the uh, nuclear pores, cell cycle state. Remember, I mentioned that cell cycle was much much longer than the period, but it's not the microscopic events in the birth death processes of the oscillator. Okay, so so that's I think that's a lesson that we learn just from looking at the noise, and I haven't even talked about the genes. Oh, sure, sure, sorry, I didn't explain that at all. I, I beg your pardon. Um, so AI is any given peak, the amplitude of any given peak, and I, I plus one is the next one. So we compare the correlation between any peak and its successor. And the same is true here. We compare a, the, the period, the interpeak interval, and the next one. And we run along all the time traces comparing what, what the... Yeah. Okay. Uh, so now let's talk about the genes. So this is the next topic, which is negative feedback. So there'll be no surprise if we've got an oscillator that we need some negative feedback. And um, we oscillators can work with negative and positive feedback and all sorts of other bells and whistles. But, but, it's, but it might be the case that, in, that here, there's quite a simple negative feedback loop. Uh, simple is always relative. And that's what I want to talk about now, what the model in the field for, for that is. So the model in the field depends on the, uh, has come from knowing what the genes that are oscillating are. So the green gene I showed you in the movies at the beginning encodes a family of, uh, encodes, it comes from a family of, a tran of transcription factors called basic helix loop helix transcription factors. And that's not important except to say that they uh, dimerize, and that is important. Uh, they can homodimerize and heterodimerize with other protein family members. They bind to DNA in a sequence-specific way. So when, you, when we've been talking about uh, enhancers and promoters previously, that's exactly the kind of thing we'd be talking about here. And um, we and others have uh, measured those proteins binding to their own enhancers. So that lets you sketch out a very simple scheme where the, the expression, transcription of one of these genes, translation into the protein, dimerization, and binding to its own, nucle uh, own gene could complete a negative feedback uh, circuit, and that could, in principle, give rise to oscillations. So for, for that to, to happen, of course, that's not the only dynamical outcome of a, of a negative feedback loop. It could uh, go to some sort of steady state, but these systems will oscillate if the timescales of the um, 
of the if the uh, the half lives of the mRNA and the protein are short, so they, they turn over quickly, uh, in comparison to how long it takes you to get round the cycle one. So maybe sort of first return time coming around the, around the, the cycle. So um, otherwise, those products will just accumulate, and you won't see any strong effect of switching the gene back off again. And under those circumstances, the other thing that you would want to say is that the period is given to first approximation by, um, by the delays to go around the cycle. Because I can't go any faster than, the cycle can't go any faster than it can deliver the off signal back to itself. Very sort of simple, yeah. Um, they dimerize very fast. They've got a very fast uh, on rate, also very fast off rate. I would be surprised if they weren't dimerizing in the cytoplasm, but I don't actually have any direct evidence for that. They, they can't bind DNA unless they dimerize. They can dimerize without DNA being there, that's for sure in vitro, but whether in these cells they are dimerizing first in the cytoplasm and then entering the nucleus, uh, I don't know. I actually don't know the answer to that. Okay, so this, this um, I wanted now to talk about a model that we've used in the field, which has really been extremely influential, um, dominant, in fact. And it's got some strengths, and it's got a couple of weaknesses. And I'm going to, I'm going to talk about it briefly now, and then um, I'm going to use it to think about three period mutants that have been reported and, and basically form our, our knowledge about how to think about this, how this um, feedback loop is constructed and how it works. So basically, um, you keep track of the protein dynamics, which is being made, and those are given by the, by the amount of um, mRNA you've got. So M stands for mRNA. Um, uh, and there's a, so that's being produced, and then this is uh, being degraded. So there's a, a degradation rate here. Um, and the amount of protein is read off the amount of mRNA uh, at some time in the past. So there's, this is where the delay comes in. This is the, the delay of producing the protein. Let's see if I've got this right. And then the change in the mRNA is given by uh, some production term, which depends on the amount of mRNA in the past, uh, and some degradation term. And so I'm going to go into these uh, in a bit more detail. So where mRNA is being produced, this is a regulatory function here, and the protein is being produced up here, and produced and degraded. So putting in a fixed delay means that we've got a delay differential equation. And these are, these are very difficult to treat analytically. Um, I just got frightened and didn't even bother to try treating them analytically, but some informed colleagues of mine say that they're, they're uh, very difficult, if not impossible, to solve analytically. But they are good for simulating. They, they work very well for numerical simulations. And um, they're also, in some way, uh, uh, Produce a, they give you an intuitive way to think about the problem because the delay turns up explicitly like that. So, I'm, so uh, and I'll come to some other models in a sec. So the degradation rates here, B and C, are um, reciprocal of the half-lives of the molecules, which um, is the half-life here and, and here. I'm just trying to, um, that, so the, the half-life of the protein, which is, which is uh, B, is given by the reciprocal of the, um, the half-life. So the degradation rate is the reciprocal of the half-life, and conversely for the, for the mRNA. And the repression function is basically some production rate divided by a Hill function, which basically gives you a switch going from being all on. As the protein rises, there's some nonlinearity, uh, which converts that into an off switch. So you can, you can say two things about this model. In order for the oscillations to happen, there's got to be a balance between the production rate of the protein and the degradation rate, protein and mRNA, and their, and, their, um, and, their, and their degradation. And that's got to be larger than the amount of protein that will feed back onto the, um, will feed back, is required to get an off. And, uh, and then if this holds, then the period can be approximated basically by the total delay and then modified by the by the half lives, times by two. Yeah, 
Yeah, I would have to go and look at the derivation. I can't tell you off the top of my head. Yeah, so this, these, this is work done by Julian Lewis. Um, and I, yeah, where did that two come from? I'd be making it up. Let's, let's have a look afterwards, see if we can find where the two comes from. <laughs> yeah, it would, be, it would be interesting if it was seven. Because seven doesn't turn up very often, right? Have you noticed that? Not nearly often enough, because it's actually my favorite number. Um, right, uh, good. So, so let's so let's say that so you can parameterize this this model, and here's one of the weaknesses. One of the one of the weaknesses is that the delays are hard. You you insert the delay, and so the model behaves according to the number you insert. So the the total time of the oscillator isn't doesn't emerge so naturally from the dynamics. It it's dominated by the delay. Okay, and uh, but you can make guesses for these various parameters, and if you're happy to allow a bit of fiddling and, sorry, and, and tuning, you can produce simulations which match very nicely your favorite uh, oscillating animal. Okay, and so, yeah. You, yeah, abs absolutely. I mean, I think that, so this is, this is clearly uh, massively simplified um, and what I'm trying to argue is that that might be a price worth paying it, it you're you're somehow always searching for the right granularity of your model which will match the things you can measure you could put lots of stuff in the model that you can't measure and it's not clear it's not always clear that that's going to help you understand the situation. If you think you might be able to measure something, and you should make it, maybe make that as explicit as you can, and then maybe the art is working out what the coarse graining or the abstraction is for the other for the other parameters. So, I shouldn't. Um, I uh, I think this model is already very complicated, actually. Um, uh, and so I'm trying to introduce it because it's being used. This is the model in the field. Everyone talks about this model. You can argue whether it's the best one to choose, uh, and I'll show you some. I'll show you an adaptation of it. Uh, but there are others you could pick. So maybe I've got uh, yes. <laughs> Love your work. Um, so there's a bunch of other ways. <laughs> Man, this is amazing. How did you know? Um, yeah, there's a bunch of other ways you could choose to write write down uh, even even a very simple. And so I've got this I've got this more detailed diagram here where I've got dimerization, I've got I've got monomers decaying, I've got dimers decaying, I've got transport. You could include things like transport out of the nucleus, splicing. Uh, yeah, there's a bunch of things you could you could do. So and then you could be much more explicit about what's happening on the DNA. You could choose to model the, the binding explicitly. You could put in multiple binding sites. And there's a bunch of work being, be, that's been done about that. The big problem is that none of those models up to now have got any experimental counterpart that lets us say, oh, OK, so this model has seven sites. This, this model tests the difference between having one to 10 sites which are filled at different occupancies. But no one's ever built a fish or a mouse editor where there are one to seven sites. So that's why I'm, I'm leaving those. I think this should be interesting, but that's why I'm not, talk, I'm not, I'm not going to discuss them. Uh, so that's, that's, what, that's one thing about consider other events. But you might still be in a sort of ODE framework. Uh, um, and the other thing would be to say, well, maybe there aren't very, with this oscillators going quite fast, maybe there aren't very many uh, molecules involved. And so maybe the approximation of an ODE is not is not the right one if we want to understand uh, the noisiness in the system. And so there are some papers here, which I'm, I'm listing here, which uh, have used uh, Gillespie algorithms and other techniques to, to get at sort of a more, maybe more realistic uh, chemical situation. OK. So now what I want to do is I want to talk about three period mutants in the remaining uh, half an hour. right? And um, uh, Two mouse uh, mutants and uh, a zebrafish mutant, all from the same family. I'm going to start off introducing period mutant, which we've borrowed the term from the circadian field, and it means any mutation or treatment alteration to the genome which changes the period of the main observable, which in this case is, some, is segment formation. And so 
uh, going from the HES6 mutant, which, which we isolated by a retrovirus landing into the HES6 gene, um, we noticed that the, the fish made its segments more slowly. These are the, the, the orange segments, and the blue segments are as wild-type siblings. It's about 6%, 6 7% slower. It's incredibly reliable. It's not very much, but it actually changes the size of the segments that are formed uh, by 6 to 7%. And in the final animal, it reduces the number of backbones uh, by 7 or 8%. So what that means is, quantitatively, the animal that was made from a, a clock that appears to be ticking 7% slower uh, has an altered segment size and it has an altered segment number exactly predicted by the change in the period of, the, of, the, of segment formation. So that's a, good, that's, a, uh, that's a good period mutant. And it was the first sort of, I think, general test that these two relations might be true and that we might be thinking in, in the right direction, that you, you can reach into this putative clock in the posterior, you can change its timing, and what comes out of that are, are changes to segment length and number. Okay, I'm going to leave that there. I'm going to come back to it. What I want to do now is to tackle some of the claims that some of the ideas that come up in considering the delay differential model. These will, uh, these are sort of viewed in in the light of the delay differential model. But things like uh, half life of the protein will appear in almost any model that you make. Where, where you've got that, that protein in there. So I think it's still generally maybe lessons to be learned. OK, so this it was a wonderful piece uh, of work from uh, Kagi, the Kagiyama lab. And they reasoned that maybe we could make this, uh, that they could make the uh, cycle tick slower if they could change the half-life of the protein. It's a clear prediction from the model. So they scanned through the HES7 protein. They looked for all of the lysine residues, which has the, the abbreviation K, because Lysines are the target for a modification uh, that destabilizes a protein and causes its degradation. It's ubiquitination. Uh, that detail doesn't matter. But what they found was they mutated each of these lysines in turn, and they're listed down here. And then they expressed the protein uh, in, a, uh, in a cell a cell culture, and they assayed the protein's ability to repress. So here's, here's an unrepressed promoter at one, and now uh, so this is the promoter they're going to try and repress. The N-box will bind that protein. And then you ask the question, can I switch off the luciferase? Okay. And the wild type, the normal HES7 protein switches it off. The K14R does. These var variants can't switch, the, can't switch the reporter gene off. So they were no longer considered because they're not repressors anymore. Uh, and these, these two also worked effectively wild type. They only made one mouse, and it was the... Uh, the K14R, I think. No, it was 118G. <laughs> uh, and now I've... Um, so, sorry, let me go back. And now, um, in the same cell line, they measured the half-life of these of the various proteins. So they wanted to say, we want to make a mouse. We want to put this altered gene. We want to know that it at least in cell culture, it can still repress a target, and we want to know that we made a different half-life. So they chose uh, one particular version, and here they've altered their numbering. So they chose, they chose a protein with a longer half-life. Let me just, um, it's K14R. And here we see what happens when they made a transgenic mouse with the animal. So um, what I'm showing you now is an early mouse embryo. Oops with its head uh, here and its tail here. And here it's formed just three segments. I don't know if you can see that. It's, it's a bit small. Um, and here are two, two different mouse embryos, uh, both wild type. And you can see these striped patterns of the segmentation clock genes in the posterior. If the HES7 gene is removed altogether, so now the whole gene is, is deleted, then you see some sort of patchy expression of these genes, but no real stripes. And now you don't have any stripes in that tissue anymore. And this is interpreted as having completely wrecked the mouse clock. There's no more oscillations. You can't make segments. And in fact, the skeleton of this animal is badly perturbed. Um, when, oops. Um, and so here's one of the mutant versions with a longer half-life. And you can see that it's still forming anterior segments. And it still has some oscillatory pattern in the back. 
So it doesn't appear to have an obvious change, but when they look just a few hours later, uh, th here's the wild type and the full mutant, and now they look at their mutant variant, you can see that, the, that over time the system has uh, come undone. So just a few hours later, there's no remaining uh, stripe patterns, and you can see early segments have been made, and then the posterior segments are, are defective. So this clock has undergone a transition from, from having rhythmic behavior at the beginning and then losing the rhythmic behavior. So they've come, they've come returned to this model, and they said, okay, well, um, they parameterized that they've changed the half-life of the protein to match what they got in the cell culture. It's an open question whether that's the half-life of the protein in the animal, but that's a good start, I think. And they've run the model. Strangely enough, they've kept all the other uh, values the same as the original zebrafish model. Does it matter? I don't know. Um, and here's the behavior that they get um, uh, with the, the oscillator having a longer period and then damping. And so, so uh, is this convincing, I think, is the question. And I think it's, a, it's a, uh, an amazing piece of engineering, of genetic engineering, to think about trying to engineer the period of the clock, to make a variant protein, to go through all the testing, and to make it. But um, what you really want to see is uh, an oscillator that's persistently ticking with a different period because there's lots of ways to break a clock. And to play the devil's advocate, I could fiddle these numbers and get almost any dynamic behavior I liked out of the system. So this is consistent with the change in the phenotype that we saw being because of the longer half-life. But I, I would argue, and I have argued many times to uh, Ruchiro, that um, this, is not, this is not conclusive. Okay. This is consistent, but not conclusive. OK, cool. So that's, that's the Harata paper. So this, is, this paper is actually cited quite often as proving that a longer half-life will slow down the oscillations. Um, but, uh, but it doesn't. OK, so that's important to know. OK, what about speeding up the clock? Um, so again, this is now, um, this is now uh, nearly 10 years later, um, again from Ryuchiro Kageyama's lab. And this is a, an astonishing piece of work because uh, Harima, what she did was she made, she took the HES7 gene and she said, what if we can speed up the production of the mRNA by deleting the introns? So when a gene is transcribed, you have to polymerize the RNA across all the introns, and then you have to splice them. And both those events take time. It's not clear exactly how much time they do take, but they take some time. And so the reasoning is, if I remove those events, then I can, I can finish making the, the cell can finish making the mRNA quicker, and so the total delay to go around the loop should be less. I think it's a perfectly reasonable uh, proposal. So what's the length of the They're about twice the length of the exons. Yeah, the introns are about twice the length of the exon. Yeah, so so there are there are some so polymerases move pretty fast, maybe two kilobases, three kilobases a minute, and some genes have massive introns, uh, kilobases, megabases, even in some cases. And in this and in those cases, you can take uh, it can take hours for the polymerase to clear to move along the to move along the gene. And this is this has been recorded. This is known. A gene that's this short where you've got, um, as you point out, that's not so different, and at a, for a high speed for a polymerase, is it going to make any difference? Um, splicing introns seems to take about five minutes per intron, and it's not clear what sets that time. That's a very loose estimate, come from a number of different systems. Uh, so, so, um, that's, so they said, well, let's take them out and see what happens. Uh, and so, again, Testing this in a cell culture line, these constructs were expressed, and you can and these these plots here are um, the heat shock, um, they serum shock the cell, and then that that causes the the gene in the cell to be expressed. And now what they're measuring is uh, if it's got introns or none or just one intron, how long does it take to reach maximal value? So this is in a cell culture again, but it's it's a, it's a reasonable test. To try and see whether it does make any difference, and in fact, in fact, it does. If you if you look at the 
if you look at the, both the rates and then the, the time to maximum, um, you can see that deleting the introns systematically speeds up the production of the protein. So, okay, so qualitatively that's working. So now, again, they made transgenic uh, lines. And I'm, I'm, you might say, well, how come I'm only showing you one version? Actually, uh, Harima made all possible versions, and only one worked. So here's the one that worked. Goes into the mouse, and this is this is tr this is truly astonishing phenotype. <laughs> if you, I guess, it does help to be obsessed by segmentation for this to be a truly astonishing phenotype. But um, so a wild type mouse has uh, seven cervical vertebrae. Uh, always have seven. Uh, this is the first uh, thoracic, which is the first uh, rib-bearing um, vertebra. And actually, all mammals do. All mammals have seven. Uh, so giraffes have very long necks, but they have exactly the same seven uh, vertebrae that, that we have or that, um, or that mice have. Um, they just, in fact, in, in, in embryogenesis, they actually don't form bigger uh, than the other uh, segments. They grow by, they grow in utero, um, uh, differentially. So it's differential growth makes those segments big, not early patterning differences. So um, in contrast, birds have different numbers of segments in their neck. So the reason why a goose can do that is because it actually has more segments in its neck than a duck, for example. So there you go. OK, now what we've got here is we've got the duck-goose transition <laughs> in a mouse because what they saw was that depending on how many copies of the transgene uh, were present, uh, uh, sorry, no, the ratio of the, of the, of the wild type to the transgene, um, they could make nine or eight neck segments. That doesn't sound like a big difference, but actually it's a, it's a, it's a really uh, striking difference for a mouse em embryologist. And this suggests that because you've produced more segments and they're a little bit smaller, uh, that the clock's running faster. By 2013, um, uh, Harima could take advantage of the transgenic, the HES7 transgenic uh, reporter line that they'd made in the meantime. And what she did was she placed a, a, a region of interest over the tissue and measured the, the period of the, of the gene activity that was coming off the transgene. So this is using not a GFP, but a luciferase. Uh, but it's the same general idea. The, the reporter gene produces a signal, and you measure the frequency. And so here's the result uh, for one animal that they've plotted. and when they, uh, they're measuring uh, interpeak intervals here, and they see that when the, uh, in the transgenic animal that has the single three intron, that it's systematically shorter period. So this is, um, this, is, this is now an animal that's been engineered to have a faster rhythm. There's one interesting note. So now, so this is again how this was discussed in the field. You come back to the model, this time, uh, you leave the half-life of the protein the same, but you change the, the delay corresponding to uh, different lengths. And the 29 or the 24 is the value of minutes that corresponds to the estimated difference in production uh, of the protein that they measured in half-life. And so here they go. Here's the, here's the shorter period. Um, here's the wild type. Here's the shorter period. And it, um, sorry, here's the uh, reduced delay, and the model gives you back a shorter period. Okay, so, so this is then used in the field to say, well, okay, so the, the delay coming from the introns is real. This delay is playing the role that we thought it was. Uh, there's a couple of, a couple of the two caveats to interpreting this, though, which I think are worth, they're worth trying to understand, and I certainly don't understand them at the moment. One of them is what I, what I the, the dirty secret here is that um, this animal doesn't make normal segments in its posterior. They're, they're strongly disrupted. So the clock ran faster, but then it crashed. The same problem that happened with the other animal when the half-life was adjusted. You seem to be able to ch uh, alter the period for a while, but then, then, then it breaks. Actually, in that other, there was no evidence in the other animal, I beg your pardon, that the period had been altered. Uh, there's no evidence. Uh, in this case, there's good evidence that the period has been altered, but it's not stable. Uh, for some reason, the clock can't sustain an elevated period. And that you can see a hint of, perhaps, in this plot here, with perhaps an amplitude uh, damping here. So it's not clear. So we're still, we're still missing something. We're, we're, the other caveat, of course, is that um, all of the other combinations of introns 
uh, didn't all of them cause a complete failure of the clock. So just one variation of those introns was, was the right. So now I know that, that the Kagiyabas group is now trying to understand what it is about that intron that gives the desired timing. But I still think that uh, we don't quite understand that. It's a really good suggestion. So the idea is, um, what if this were an excitable system driven by noise? And if you drive with strong enough noise, uh, you're not going to be able to recover to your reset point, And you're just not going to see. I, I, think it's, I think it's an open question. I mean, um, when one considers the, this, uh, that feedback loop, then it looks like, it doesn't look like an excitable system. But you know, maybe we got that wrong, right? And maybe it's, it is behaving as an excitable system. So um, I'm, tr I'm trying to think now whether I know any experiments that conclusively rule out an excitable system. Let me think about it. Yeah, what a good idea. OK, that is an extremely good idea. It's a really good idea. So what I want to show you now is a mutant that does that. Exactly what you said. Uh, or something very similar. Yeah? It's, I guess, similar to the time of the tracing. So you just did this mail that was uh, close to our type of patient. Yeah. And one of the characteristics, if you have a system close to such type of patient, is that if you put forces, it will have some very typical responses, right? You know, the period of the amplitude is here. Parsing, which is quite independent actually of the detail of the system. Yes. So can you actually can you is there any way there's any a perturbation which you can try to explain those clocks? There they are the the problem with the zebrafish clock up to now is has been that it's ticking quite fast. And the kinds of changes that in the past we've been able to do take several times longer than the cycle to be introduced. But that's not an excuse, but it is an excuse. It's, but it's a call for better technology. And actually, I know that Rio's group has been using a blue light inducible transcription factor. So, you don't, so it dimerizes. So you don't have to wait for a production delay. It's present already. And the, dim, the, the time scale is the dimerization. And there's an amazing set of work from uh, um, uh, someone in his lab using pulse, uh, light pulses to try and entrain. So I won't, I won't steal that thunderbolt, but keep a, keep an eye out for it. Still, I don't. Uh, I was discussing with him whether there are any signatures of the bifurcation. I don't know if it's, if still our measurements are too crude to uh, to be able to see them. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, so I'm I'm aware, I'm aware that I've got uh, 15 minutes left. OK, so what I want to do then, uh, I'm going to skip over some of the data in the next section to talk about what I think are the, the principles. It's from, as you've gathered, most of this stuff is published, and all the references are here. I'm, trying to, I'm actually trying to work out what we know. <laughs> and uh, as usual, the, uh, the field of ignorance is much larger than the field of knowledge. Um, so let me, let me give you a sketch of this idea of having more than one clock there. Um, so, so up to now, we've discussed this simplest feedback loop. But there could be other feedback loops of operating at the same time. And now I'm going to come back to the, the notion of HES6. HES and the first thing you have to know is that in the zebrafish, there's more than one oscillating HER gene. There are two. HER1, this was the trans gene I showed you before. There's another one on the same chromosome. It's only 12 kilobases apart. It's called her 7 and this is its pattern. So these are sort of snapshots of the stripe pattern moving up, up the tissue, the mRNA. There's another gene that's also expressed in the Talbot and pre-Semitic mesoderm called HES6, and that's the gene we hit with a, with a retrovirus uh, uh, by accident. Um, and it forms a, a gradient of expression across that tissue. And so 
Uh, and so one is now has the possibility of forming various kind of feedbacks with all of these different proteins. So this is, this is, just, um, this is just a sort of all-to-all -all feedback, sort of a mean field um, coupling of all those. We took some time, and we, in vitro, we measured all of the dimerization and all of the DNA binding capacity in that network. And this, and this is what we found. We found that all of those three proteins can form homo and heterodimers with almost the same affinity. So these things are continuously exchanging uh, dimers um, here at, at, at equilibrium. And that's fast on and off. Um, however, the, and, and there are six possible heterodimers, there are six possible dimers in the system, only two of them bind DNA. So this limits the number of points of feedback onto the, expre onto the expression of these two genes to just two. Her one can form a homodimer and repress itself, and her seven actually requires her six to form a DNA, DNA binding heterodimer and come back onto the, onto the... So this is the biochemistry. I'm not going to show you the data for that. Um, but this all to all gets severely reduced to just having two uh, t two loops. So, okay, here we go. So remember, I said that Hes six was a dimer. Uh, Hes six was a period mutant. Um, What can I show you? Okay. Sorry, folks. Um, right. What I want to do is give you a very brief snapshot of what, what each of those mutants looks like, and then the doubles. So I'm going to accumulate all the hits into this circuit, okay? Uh, HES6, um, it segments almost normally, so this is what the circuit looks like. No HES6, HER1 can still complete the feedback loop, and we see uh, essentially normal segmentation. We see the clock with its uh, stripe patterns, and that's the one where we had the period mutant, 7% uh, change in the period. Okay, HER1, mutant segment normally all, almost um, as well. He's a HER1 mutant, and actually you have to look pretty hard to see that the defects sit here. And again, you can see the stripe patterns in the HER1 mutant. So clock looks to first approximation intact. And that's explained in the topology for the biochemistry because this feedback loop is still intact. So both those guys should be fine. The HER7 mutant is interesting. It should still have the HER1 feedback loop running. So it should work. But actually, here's where we don't quite, where there's a mismatch to the biochemistry in some way um, because the posterior doesn't segment properly. So somehow, in the presence of extra HES6, this isn't stable any longer. Something's going on up here, probably. Um, and the clock's um, still ticking early on, and it seems to be badly damaged in the posterior. Now I'll make the doubles. If you take out HER1 and HER7, you would expect that nothing should happen, right? It should be badly damaged. So here's HER7 and the HER1 individual, and when you combine those two together, you see segmentation defects along the whole axis. Okay, so that's in, that's in line with what we'd expect. I will point out that there's a couple of really good segments in the middle of this animal, and every now and then a good segment turns up in these, in these creatures, so I, that's a fact. I can't explain it. Um, but when we look, And when we look at the gene expression patterns, we never see any stripes in those guys. So it looks like we've got some sort of severe problem in our clock. Uh, if we take out, if we leave her seven in, but take six and, and one out, so now we don't have, we see uh, an almost identical phenotype. I find it difficult uh, both in the segments and in the clock genes. I find it personally very difficult to tell the difference between those two combinations, one and seven out or one and six out. But if we take six and seven out, um, we, we rescue the phenotype. So this double, if you've already lost seven or already lost six, it doesn't get that much. <laughs> you, you actually uh, rescue the phenotype. You actually, you, you no longer have this defect in the posterior. Can you see that? So taking her, taking her six out in addition gets rid of this defect. So, so her six, 
So HES6, when it was present, was somehow poisoning the system, causing these defects. And when you pull it out, now you're running purely on HER1, and, and it's fine. So that, that's, that's a clue. And, um, and that, that uh, mutation oscillates as well. Okay, so now, right, so now we can measure the period. And what we'd expect, if HER7 and HES6 are equivalent, all they're doing is forming this feedback heterodimer, we should expect the period difference to be the same. Um, but it's not. So HER7 actually has the same period as wild type within the error of the measurement. HER1 has no change in the period. So this is now, you can now see this redundancy in the system where we're not changing the period by pulling things out. But HES6, uh, you saw that data already, but now we're combining it with the HES6 and HER7 that, that, um, that the HER7 double homozygote has the same period as the HES6. So the HES6 period change is dominant. It doesn't get any worse when we pull out HER7 in addition. So how do we make sense of this? Okay, so what I'm going to do is uh, I'll tell you the conclusions um, and just say that we used a variant of the Lewis model with delays. Can you see the delays? This is the, product, this is the, um, the delay for HER1. Uh, this is the delay for HER7. And we explicitly included this time dimerization because the topology... I just showed you, that can't explain the differences in the phenotype. HER7 and HER6 should be identical. The differences in the phenotypes have to come from something off the DNA, and so that's why we included explicit modeling of the dimers. So let me tell you um, what, we, what this model predicts. Uh, initially, we set all of the um, parameters to be one or equal to each other. We didn't put any asymmetry into the model apart from the asymmetry in the topology. We couldn't simulate the data properly, uh, so we introduced two asymmetries. Uh, the first one was, um, came from looking at the HES6 mutant. So you look at a HES6 mutant by simulating that system and setting production of HES6 to zero. And now you increase the production of HES6 until the offset matches the observed difference between mutant and wild type. And that gives you a production rate for HES6 that's nine times bigger than that for uh, 1 and 7. Okay? That's the first asymmetry that we had to put in. And then um, the next asymmetry uh, was that when we simulated a HER7 mutant, we actually get uh, a, a damping, um, but we get the period wrong. And to get the period to match the wild type, we have to say that the HER1 gene takes a little bit longer to make than the HER7 gene. So that's consistent with the intron-based delays that we saw in the previous study. Um, and then it, then it matches quite well. Uh, so this, we're not trying to parameterize this with seconds or minutes or anything. This is all this some sort of uh, internal time scale. And of course, the 7-6 uh, matches. OK, so the point here is that the dynamics uh, matching the periods, getting the periods right, all of, all of that comes from these interactions up here. So the dimerization with each other uh, changes the... Um, so let, let me just get this right. Um, in the HES6 mutant, um, you, in the HES6 mutant, HER7 and HER1 no longer degrade at the same rate because their, their degradation uh, depends on a nonlinear effect with forming all the dimers. So by... By pulling HES6 out of the system, 1 and 7 can't degrade at the same rate. So they become, their effective stability goes up and the period slows down. So the presence of HES6 is changing the way the other, the other proteins degrade uh, in the model. And um, the HER7 phenotype comes about because um, in the absence of HER7, HES6 is freed up and now titrates HER1 out. And without HER1, enough HER1, this feedback loop won't complete properly, and the oscillations damp. So that in the model, the explanations for these two phenotypes come from uh, changing degradation and sequestration all in this dimer cloud. They're not coming from the activity down here on the DNA. OK, so I'm, I know I went over that too fast uh, in the interest of time. The message is that, in the model at least, what's predicted is that it's uh, the dynamics in the dimer cloud are playing 
an important role in setting the dynamics uh, of, of the oscillatory circuit. Not just the guys binding DNA, but also their interactions in non-DNA binding partners. So here's an example where we have two coupled circuits. They're coupled by dimerizing. So in a sense, each of these could be a clock, but they're coupled through the ability to dimerize into this, into this dimer cloud up here. OK. There's one prediction that the model makes, which is that the HES6 protein level should oscillate. You can't have this working unless HES6 protein levels oscillate. And that's because the, uh, uh, just as the 1 and 7 are being degraded along with HES6, well, HES6 is being degraded along with 1 and 7. And so it follows an oscillatory path. This is the plot from the, from the model. So we raised an antibody to HES6. Uh, and we had a look at its pattern. And we found stripes of HES6. Now, HES6 transcription doesn't oscillate. This is entirely the protein levels oscillating, um, driven, uh, we would argue, the, the claim is, by the interactions between these dimers. So this was a, this was a complete surprise. It's a non-trivial pred prediction of the model. Of course, it doesn't mean the model's right. It just means it's useful for now. OK, so um, there's a conclusion there. There's a two-loop parallel negative feedback. The short period, um, maybe, maybe if you have a short period, if you have more genes in parallel, you're more robust. You're less susceptible to, to fluctuations in, in, the, in, the, in the molecule number from cycle to cycle. Um, and the presence of HES6 uh, enables you to, the system to tune from using only HER1 to increasing amounts of HER7 being able to come back onto the DNA. And you can think of situations where that might be useful. And to get the basic phenotype, the basic phenotypes of oscillating or not are explained by the topology. But the dynamics, to get the dynamics right, you need to include these effects in the dimer cloud. Good. So that's it. First tier. Um, there are noisy autonomous oscillators in the segmentation clock. There's a negative feedback mechanism which we think depends on the Hess-Her family of genes by autorepression. Um, and we have a set of mutants, some engineered, some naturally occurring, which do change the period. But I think what you'll gather is we don't really understand how they're doing it. We're still not in a position where we can design a change to that circuit and get a stable oscillator back and predict the change in the period. Um, so I think that's these are still open questions. These are things we need to be able to understand. Uh, just to quickly list them now, uh, it's not clear to me that oscillators in amniotes, mouse and chicken, are autonomous. So that, I think, is, is, is we need to understand. Uh, what the real effect of having multiple proteins is, still not well understood. To, we need to understand this idea of having the dimer cloud um, in more detail. What are the sources of noise? That we don't understand. Can, can we go from a genetic regulatory network type description or understanding and explain the single cell data, the way the noise in that single cell data works? That's, only, that's very recent data. We haven't actually done the experiments. And I'm not sure that, that we'll be able to do that yet. Um, and then there may be other oscillators. And I sort of cheated by giving you other oscillators from the same family. But it could be that there's uh, other genes oscillating. It could even be that the idea of a simple negative feedback uh, is not right, and that some sort of excitable system is in, instead at the heart of, of the system. OK, that's really it today. The two big open questions are communication between oscillators, which will be tomorrow, and then the tissue level control of these oscillators, which will be on Saturday evening. So thank you very much.